Chandler's contribution. Nineteen forty seven. So let me write down the remarks uh, Chandler has. Reduce modulus theory. Assume that the column remains straight up. But one thing I told you in the first class, if you recall, I told you that do not follow anybody's footstep. This model is not going to work with you. You need to find the, the better model. This is the old-fashioned model. I mean consultancy service. Old-fashioned model for actually for people before my age. Older people. Uh, uh, this is you you be finding something better to do, so making the product, making the innovation, or so on. Okay, but but I just give you example that finally the core value of struggling and learning and problem solving is going to be there, and it will be the crucial important tool that you use for innovation, for consultancy, for for many kind of service that other people cannot do. I leave it with you today. Well, ten years later, let me know if it works for you, <laughs> or let me know if it doesn't work for you. <laughs> ah, okay. So uh, first, ne, reduce modulus. Assume that column remains straight up to the buckling load, and then what? keeps a column straight to the buckling load which is predicted by reduce modulus theory So, um, let's see here. This is a load deformation plot. So, we start with the PR and PT. 
PT stands for the tangent modulus load and PR stands for the reduced modulus uh, so we want to see if it's going like this or if it's going like this I mean the behavior of the column and it should be tied up with the stress strain relationship of the material so you have different material that also that will affect the behavior of the load carrying mechanism at the buckling level uh, well just just wait a bit we we are going to see the pictures of the how things really work in the column buckling and that's going to explain why this theory is not working why the other theory is working okay anyhow the experiment were conducted in aluminum columns and what the researcher found was that the lateral deflection started eh, around the tangent modulus buckling load So lateral deflection here that is the definition of buckling right you wouldn't supposed to have significant lateral deflection but it was spotted at the load which is associating with the tangent modulus ah, next observation is that additional load which is additional to the PT okay could be carried so that means okay you find you find the evidence of pretty much well buckling but after that more load than PT will still carry it. okay so it is above PT but less than PR okay the thing is that ah so this picture explain
the situation. You apply the load to one given column. The load goes up. You find, or you may not even find the lateral deformation. So it keeps going up, 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 up um, until PT. Once you hit PT, then significant lateral deformation was observed. Either, well, number one or number two. But at this point, it is defined as the bifurcation point. Bifurcation occurs at the PT. The deformation, the significant deformation start at PT. But still, your structure carry more load from that PT level. This is the finding. Okay. So, uh, if we look into the um, the pictures here. I don't want to draw, but uh, you just copy. I will just explain. So we have five situations. The first situation is column is elastic. So the load P1 was applied is the elastic load. You have the elastic stress sigma 1. And then you apply more load. Okay. Uh, now you separate between two things, elasticity and uh, inelasticity. Oh. Uh, no, no. Elasticity and instability. Okay. It is two separate issues. So the material model for this uh, could be like this. It has proportional limit, okay, and it goes up, still can go up. So the sigma two stress at the next limit state. Stress number two is inelastic already. Inelastic already means it is beyond this line, above this line inelastic but not buckle not yet so this is the the perfect inelastic buckling it it has the inelastic component first but not buckle yet and then uh, buckling come later next inelastic and right at the bifurcation point so you might have sigma 3 which is greater than sigma 2 because this allows you to go up still. Actually for the steel, yes, it, it can go like that because it has a strain hardening. Ah. So you come to the state number 3 in elastic and it is the point just right at the bifurcation. So it is about to, moment is about to come in. Then you come to the next state. At this moment, I let me ask you, what is the current modulus? Modulus is ET. Okay, it's actually ET from here. And ET here as well. Okay, so modulus is ET throughout the cross section. Because every, everywhere is yielding. You are using tangent modulus. So once it loses the stability, lateral deformation came in, moment came in. There you have this situation. This situation you have the ET that side and the E on the other side. The E come from elastic unloading. So that's why you get the E. Okay. And then 
you progress to the next stage where uh, you have a uh, sort of like more moment or whatever which is caused by instability uh, can I just get this like a shift of the axis that means the load uh, I, I wrote over here you have P1, P2, P3 uh, I should make the beautiful version of this one P1, P2, P3 P3 is right at the buckling eh? and then the next one next to P3 it was some fraction which is greater than P3 This is the strain and strain relationship. Uh, sigma 1 should be somewhere in here. Sigma 2 is at the yielding state already. Okay. So uh, the one right next to this P3, you have the load, which is just a little bit above the 1.1 1 .1 is just to give you the sense that it is just a little bit above the P3. I shall also say that P3 is the PT, uh, okay, tangent modulus load but it is just right there so it is just right at bifurcation right at bifurcation lateral deformation is about to pop in but not yet it is just and then so it is just just a small fraction above the PT that means the lateral the last lateral deformation must come involved in this step already as soon as you exceed the PT even though it's just a little bit okay and if you keep loading further uh, and then neglecting the excessive deformation you just disregard that excessive deformation let it go let it deform but you keep loading until you get the load drop you get the peak and then it drops then you got to get the PR which is the load produced by reduced modulus theory so basically yes the Engesser second theory which is the reduced modulus theory or double modulus theory it works it gives the right prediction but that right prediction is the upper bound of the buckling problem so that means the PR will be reached but after the bad deformation is coming in the structure is badly deformed you don't want it to look like that it is not the load for use it is the load that you might observe in the laboratory only hmm. 
Bifurcation PT. It is here. So you need to come up just a little bit to, to activate the lateral deformation. It is not like the column in uh, derivations of the what, rigid column with the spring that you reach the PT and then shoo, bifurcation goes like this. This is the reality that the curve will go up to the right. Okay, so as soon as you are at PT, you 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 don't you don't see any any inclination. Your stress is perfectly uniform still. You will see that after. So I I put the figure like okay, something times PT more than one PT. Or uh, to make it uh, more like the educated people, let's say that it is the alpha PT where the PT is less than alpha PT and less than P subscript R <laughs> if you want. So this is precisely correct. Why is what? Why is that? All right. Let me move this down first. Actually, why don't we just write a good one? Too small. Uh, I I I I am going to explain you along with this thing here. For steel, uh, okay. So we had the this is a proportional limit. This is eh. Sometimes the algorithm is not the smart. Sigma and epsilon and uh, I mean sigma, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and sigma corresponding to reduced modulus load. Okay, and why? Uh, here uh, we have. This one is E. This one is ET. When the material is unloaded, even though the load is already beyond the corresponding u uh, the, the the u load okay if the load beyond that point already what you will see here will be oh this is the unloading
elastic unloading occur in this region when the moment comes in it produces the tension and compression your column is subjected to the compression to the through the yield compressive stress okay so right now it is on the compressive side but once some area is subjected to the tension which is the part caused by the moment that tension zone is going to be elastically unloaded so here, here is called the elastic unloading Whereas the other part is still in elastic. Because you have additional compression. So that will be in elastic. compression yielding two different zones For this one, I should put this compression, compressive stress. Okay. So when elastic unloading here is the tension you add more tension to your behavior okay ah. now let me move to the next page So this is the how to say it's a schematic of the experiment that was conducted. I mentioned that the aluminum column test was carried out in the laboratory to see the effect to see the buckling of the column under the PT and the behavior that trying to reach the PR so this is a specimen description okay. so uh, should be okay if this is like this then five one two three one two three four oh one two three four five this one huh okay 
a little too long. So I just put this together. I put this one together. Uh -huh. A little bit. Okay, yeah, looks alike. And So uh, the column that was tested over here uh, combines two major parts. First, the column, uh, this part is rigid column. The way we call it rigid because it is a lot more rigid than the important thing at the middle which is the deformable cell. So So let's give a detail of the deformable cells a little bit. Uh, it is made of uh, like this. dimension it and the center The length is L over 2 and L over 2 on both sides. 
Uh, let me borrow the dotted line from the back here. find that the angle we define the angle this way uh, theta not okay be this one and the delta not be this one so uh, the P load resupply you expect the reaction of the load okay that that's the uh, overall picture of the test specimen uh, And we now focus on the deformable cell. So I'm going to draw in red. the center to center Too bad a uh, good node cannot just fill in the the area. Let's get to Okay, almost almost. So uh, there are two pieces that deform just this way according to the buckling shape you found on the left hand side and I dimension uh, this. equals to D and your load will be one side compression the other side tension okay. 
Okay. So we have the key one as the compression and P two as the tension. The cross sectional area I'll give you another thing. The undeformed size of the cell is equal to D as well and uh, you have E1 strain 1 the area on this side is A over 2 the area on this side is also A over 2 it is subjected to epsilon 2 and E2. The E2 elastic module, uh, the modulus for 1 and 2 could be different because one side might be unloading and the other side could be loading. Now, we have the external moment. which is applied to the cell which is basically buckling eh? so second order moment here is equal to P times delta naught and the delta naught can be computed in terms of P theta naught times L over 2 next curvature calculation we can compute the curvature which is equal to well we have two definitions first you have the change of angle right curvature so change of angle over a finite length so here you have theta naught and here you have minus theta naught yeah? So theta naught here and theta naught here. So total change of angle is equal to two theta naught. Divide by the finite length which is D. This D. And that is equal to, well, if you have strain, strain here and strain there, and you have this depth, again, you get curvature. So it is a different, another way to compute. So strain 1 plus strain to divide by the D uh, here that means the strain 1 and strain 2 they are having the different size from, from this calculation the size are different you you can see that one is the tensile strain and another is the compressive strain, right?
that makes the theta naught theta naught equals to epsilon one plus epsilon two divided by two and theta naught is also equal to two times delta naught over L. I am going to show epsilon 1, epsilon 2 this is the depth And then your delta naught is uh, is equal to L over four times epsilon. And we know that P one. is equal to area E1 epsilon 1 and P2 is equal to area E2 epsilon 2 So we will find internal moment the MI is equals to P one plus P two D over two. is equal to A D over four <coughs> so the P theta not L over 2 which is P theta not L over 2 is coming from here is equal to this term And P turns out to be just A D over L E one epsilon one plus E two epsilon two epsilon one plus epsilon two
if the cell is elastic E1 is equal to E2 is equal to E and then the P is equals to a d e over l okay because one and two if they are identical that cancel out so not one and two not identical but the e1 and e2 are identical so you pull out and then epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 was taken out, cancel out and then you get PE equals to A, D, E over L if the cell is fully inelastic E1 equals to E2 equals to E tangent then the P subscript T is equals to A D E T over L now what if uh, Let uh, tau be the e t over e, which is less than one. So it's just the ratio that describes the tangent modulus that is weaker than the original elastic modulus e. Just that. Then. We substitute everything back into the expression for P. P is equal to A times D over L. For the 1, is a compression. For the 2, is under tension. So this Compression side and tension side. Okay, so compression side when you load it it will be exhibiting the behavior E T okay times epsilon one plus E, which is on the tension side, epsilon 2, epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. So I just want to make sure that this is a elastic unloading. And then uh, we have a d over l multiplied by e t epsilon one plus 
e t e p s i l o n 2 minus e t e p s i l o n 2 plus e e p s i l o n 2 okay it remains the same as before i just add in the term and subtract that term off So doing so, we're gonna have the a d over l. First of all, this will cancel out because you can take the common factor e t, and then the rest gets uh, cancelled plus. E minus e t. Epsilon two over epsilon one plus epsilon two. Which is equal to oh yeah the long one a d e t over l times one plus one over t a l minus one. Epsilon two, epsilon one plus epsilon two, over here, this is P T. So we just. Make it P T times one plus one over t a l minus one epsilon two L over four delta naught, and make it equation star. And then uh, 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 P is equal to P T plus P one plus P two P one minus P two. So the PT is like a average sense, right? At the at the full cross section yielding, and then the P1 minus P2 is just the difference that is coming from those two cells. So adds up on top of PT. I think we're gonna. Need some part of the next class to explain and elaborate of this epsilon one minus e two epsilon two, and substitute this one by e t and this one by just e. Equal to what? 
A D E T over L plus A over two E T epsilon one plus epsilon two minus A over two such a long story plus E T epsilon two yeah, I think we're gonna need to come and spend time you just for this time put everything in A D E T over L you pull it out one plus Epsilon one plus Epsilon two we try to write everything in terms of the delta and then minus e over e t plus one f epsilon two l two d oh boy equals to pt again times 1 plus 2 delta naught over d minus 1 over tau plus 1 l epsilon 2 over 2d close the bracket equation double star And then from star and double star. Well, the point is that we are going to plot only the P with the delta, okay? Uh, we don't want to include the strain terms in the expression. If we have it, then you have just two axes. You can have the load, you can have the delta. Ultimately, you want just to plot between these two. Okay, so you, you, you get rid of the strain. And turns out the P is equal to PT. 1 plus 1 over d 2 delta naught plus 1 plus tau okay 1 minus tau okay so if we let Let tor be 0 0.5. Our P turns out to be PT 1 plus 1 over D plus 3 divided by 2 delta naught. to the plot why today the pencil is so sensitive it understand that I do the double tap and change from 
switch from pencil to rubber uh. ah okay so this is the ratio between p over pt you normalize it and this is the ratio between delta naught to d uh, the plot over here is a plot between P over PT which is equal to 1 plus 1 over a half A half of d over delta naught plus three. So if your d over delta naught is equal to zero, no, 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 cannot. Delta naught have to have some value, so that will be at the one two three four five and paste one three three is here okay so uh, this level is one point three three this is one point zero <laughs> the top line is the axial load which is computed by reduced modulus theory And uh, curve should go like this. This is the plot. Uh, Okay, the green color is the plot of this line of this equation. Now, let's see the reality. The reality is that it goes like this. It goes above the PT. Because this, this line is 1.0, 1 1 1.0 is a axial load. Computed by tangent. modulus theory so it goes above tangent modulus theory but cannot reach to the reduced 
modulus load so observation lateral deformation I just keep in mind that equation here is only it only works when the delta is the value which is greater than zero so when you have not reached to the PT and delta is not uh, is still zero you cannot use this equation Lateral deformation starts when PT is reached buckling occurs with the increasing load you can observe from the equation From the equation, the column load or the column capacity approaches PR, reduce modular theory load asymptotically. Next, if the tall value, which is the ratio between the tangent modulus to elastic modulus, decreases with strain, which is generally the case because your curve will be like this modulus is always decreases with strain so the PR won't be reached PT will be less than P max and less than PR behavior will be seen in the dotted line there okay so turns out the uh, tangent modulus works out better than the reduced modulus and it is the first place where it picks up but the thing is that the first ingressor the first interesting theory, tangent modulus theory, it does not explain. It does not give the justification why it works. It was just explained in the oversimplified way, and that is not the the valid explanation. Okay, so later on, people help fix <laughs> the explanation to this point. Okay. Uh, tangent modulus uh, theory works but then this research or this work experiment was carried out in a simple column when the real column used in the industry 
has been tested they found the behavior which is different from this theory so we cannot just use this tangent modulus theory directly on the real column because the effects from the manufacturing as I mentioned uh, we have the other issues like the residual stress issue we have other issues like the initial out of stressness issue okay so many things have been studied and uh, sort of empirical formulas also come involved there so we will look into these matters of the column curve development which is to the next phase the reality more we talk about we talk more about the reality of the actual column right incorporating all the effects from the real world and we'll be getting the column curve uh, we, we cannot call it derived because it is incorporating many effects so we combine everything okay look into the experiments in the past and see how this column curve comes up okay so uh, okay let's continue in the next class for the column curve